Well, hello and welcome to the July 2nd, 2023 online sermon from Christian Fellowship Church. Christian Fellowship Church is located in Northwest Indiana, specifically Hammond, Indiana, and our contact information is at the end of this video. Please use it to come and be a part of our services or one of the many activities we have. And here we are, July 2nd, and we have a lot going on this summer. Most importantly, for the pressing of time, on July 10th through the 14th, we are having our soccer camp at Edison Park. Please use the contact information if you would like to have a child, a grandchild, a friend, neighbor participate in this soccer camp, ages 5 to 13. It is a wonderful time that you come learn soccer skills and get some treats, get some prizes, but most importantly, you get the Word of God. And we hope that uh, we'll see a good turnout. Already in the pre-registration, we have a lot of kids signed up. So looking forward to a blessed year. If you're someone that is a regular part of the ministry of Christian Fellowship Church, I implore you, please be praying for God's impact upon these children and upon the families. Now we're going to study God's Word in a second. We're going to transition first to our music ministry, then come back. Have your Bibles open to 1 Corinthians 15. All right. Good morning. Join us in worship this morning. You guys are going to sing loud because
Do you know where your home is? That's the question I started last week's message with, and I start this week's message with it again. The reason I ask that question is because we are talking about getting home. And as believers in Jesus Christ, we know that our ultimate destination is home in heaven. But on a earthly perspective, we all know how to get home. If you ask most people, and this is what I've been asking people in our congregation, could you give me directions to your home? People are able to do just that. They're able to do it because they regularly take the path home, no matter where they go in the community, they take that path home. And because they have that repeatedly driven into them, they are able to just give me directions. Say, go right here, go left here. You know, may not be able to say it's exactly 1.3 miles, but it's about a mile down the road. And then you take a right at the gas station and you're at my house. Listen, believers in Jesus Christ who tell me, oh, I can't memorize the key aspects of the gospel topics because it's just too complicated. Well, listen, the reality of it is if you can give directions to your physical earthly home, you definitely should be able to give directions at a minimum to your heavenly home. We have been saying that when you come to 1 Corinthians 15, and if you'll open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul talks about the five key topics of the gospel in this passage. This is a passage in which the Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthian church about the resurrection, but before he gets into the resurrection and the surety of the resurrection and the surety of the resurrection body, he wants them to understand the only way to get to a resurrection body, the only way to get to heaven is to know the gospel. And so he goes over the gospel and I have summarized what he communicates by saying it goes into five key topics. Number one, man's sin. Number two, the person of Christ. He's God and man. Third, the death of Christ. Fourth, the resurrection of Christ. Fifth, faith alone. Did I get those right? So we got man's sin, person of Christ, death of Christ. Fourth, the resurrection of Christ. Fifth, the faith alone that gives you salvation. So look, like I said, we love our physical homes. It is a place of refuge, blessing, security, <coughs> and we love it. But the reality of it is, Christians are told to long for heaven. Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. 2 Corinthians 5.8, we are of good courage and prefer rather be absent from the body and be at home with the Lord. We are to recognize that the directions to get to heaven are through Jesus. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that is in John 14. And it's a passage about how to get to heaven, directions to heaven. So, look. The importance of having directions are critical. I recently asked somebody how to get to heaven and they look like a deer in the headlights, unable to move, unable to give me a response. Someone who professed to be a believer for 20 years. We're not talking somebody who just became a believer last week. And yet they have no clue as to how to get to heaven. And I wonder, are they truly born again Christian? Every Christian knows exactly how to get to heaven because that's what they're believing in. If you don't know what you're believing in, you're not trusting it in, in, in anything then, really. So, look, the Apostle Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15. Now I make known to you, brethren, this is in verse 1, the gospel, and the word gospel means good news, which I preach to you, which you also received, and which you also stand, by which you are saved. And we talk about being saved from hell. We don't ever want to diminish that. We want people to understand that Salvation is from an eternal damnation, and it's a penalty, and people need to know that, that God is serious about judgment, serious about the permanence of what he calls death, separation from him forever in a lake of fire. So, by which you are saved, if you hold fast, and he doesn't know if you're really faithful, if you're genuine with this or not. So he says in verse 2, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believe in vain, emptiness, because there are people who say they believe, but it's not genuine. It's not something that is really of substance. And the Bible teaches about false brethren. We're not going into an in-depth study of that in this study, but the reality of it is, is the Bible is very clear. There are false brethren, people who say they are Christians, but they're not. 
Verse 3, for I delivered to you as of first importance. And there's the key line, first importance. The key little phrase, first importance, top priority. There is nothing more important than this. One million years today, it will not matter if your favorite sports team won a game, if your stocks all work out, if you're in perfect health. The only thing that will matter, are you in heaven or are you in hell? And the only thing that matters in getting you there is this gospel. So, for I delivered to you as of first importance. And right now, you either believe me or you don't. But the reality of it is, is God declares it. It is of top priority. So, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So, God wants us to know this is the top priority. And we need to understand, we need to understand that we have to have this down. And the Bible makes it very clear for me as a pastor that I am to teach you to observe all things. And the idea is, is that you need to know this. This isn't like something that should be unnegotiable. Besides, you know, angels long to look in this according to Hebrews chapter 2, this salvation. How in the world can you be a believer and not be passionate about trying to get more understanding about your eventual home and the pathway there? I am the way, the truth, and the life. You want to know Jesus. You want to know the path. So that's why I just keep reiterating, this isn't supposed to be a surprise. Man, sin, person of Christ, Christ's death, Christ's resurrection, faith alone. You have to have these down. So my hope and my desire is to be a pastor. I don't want to be embarrassed on Judgment Day and our congregation has no clue as to how to get to heaven. I, I don't want us to have somebody visit our church and not hear the gospel as I've heard from other people who have attended churches in the area, and, and they say, well, we never heard the gospel there. That's an embarrassment to those churches. But I can't control what those churches do. And I can't control what you know someone else will do as a pastor. But the reality of it is, I need to keep the gospel before you because it's a top priority. And so, as we even get ready for soccer camp, and I want our people interacting with the families that are circled around the camp watching, that we want to be ready at all times to give the gospel. And as somebody recently told me, well, oh my goodness, it'll take me hours to give you the gospel. No, it doesn't. It takes 10 seconds, 30 seconds. And I can whip off two verses for every, every topic. Man's sin, Romans 3, 23, 6, 23. Christ is God and man, Matthew 1, John 1. Christ died, Romans 4, end of all four gospels. Christ rose again, all four gospels, 1 Corinthians 15. Faith alone, John 3, 16, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. My goodness, I just went through the entire gospel. How could somebody tell me that they have no clue and, they, and, and it takes hours and, you know, endless amount of time to give the gospel? The gospel is good news and it's precious news to us who are believers. It's more than just something that's positive in the sense that it just lays there as positive. It is precious to us. So... This is part two in a series of a study that we started last week, and the idea was to get us really focused on the gospel and, and to get us willing to know it ourselves and then to give it to other people. And we went through the first three topics. So we went through the fact that, that we're sinners. You see in verse three, Christ died for our sins, and we talked about sin and missing the mark and how it means that because of sin, the three great passages we need to describe to people is that all have sinned. Every human being has sinned. And there are additional passages besides what we listed, like Genesis 3, when the first sin occurred, or Psalm 51, how David talks about in, um, in sin he was conceived. Basically, from the beginning, he was a, he was a sinner. Not that his parents were in sin when they had, had um, the conception, but the idea is that we're all born into sin. And then sin brings about death, Romans 6, 23. Why do people physically die? Why will people be sent to hell? Because the penalty is death. And I cannot keep that before you enough that we need to understand this concept of sin. And I noted that the doctrine of the study of sin is harmardiology, the study that you go into a depth of, of understanding, and it's phenomenal. I mean, it's absolutely phenomenal. It's like when I always tell people, you know, when you try to counsel people, you got to watch because sin is illogical and counsel sometimes is logical. You, you cannot help people with them being illogical the, because 1 John 3 tells us that sin is lawlessness. It follows no rules, it follows no pattern, it follows no order. 
So there's great depth in going deeper and studying sin. But at a simple entry-level concept, it is something that we all do and that we're in trouble. And because we're in trouble, we'll face God and have to answer for our sins that we tell people you can only pay this with life. And our life to pay it is marred. And this is why we're going to need Jesus. Because our love, we're sinners. And the payment for sin is death. And we, we cannot pay this off because we owe thousands of lives, tens of thousands of lives, and some people millions of lives for the sins they commit. And so we start off with understanding sin. And then we talked about how Christ alone can fix this problem because he alone is God and man. He was a, he is God who came to earth as a man. And we emphasize this because when it says in verse 3, Christ died for our sins, and then in verse 4 when it emphasized he was buried and then he was raised, the pronoun of he refers back to Christ. This is Jesus in the context. It's very clear. So we've studied that in prior studies. But that we understand that we look at passages like Matthew 1 that allude that he's called Emmanuel, he's God with us. John chapter 1, he is the, the Word made flesh. And we understand in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. We're speaking about Jesus. The Word is a, a, a reference to Jesus according to verse 14 of John chapter 1. And you need to know that Jesus was God, but when he was born, as Matthew 1 records and Luke chapter 2 records, he came as a human. And the reason he had to come as a human is because he had to be able to pay the penalty for humanity's sin. He didn't come as an angel. Hence, Hebrews chapter 2, why angels can never be saved. God had a choice. Come as a human, come as an angel. He comes as a human. From at least perception I have is that he had a choice. He could have perhaps come as an angel. But the idea is he didn't come as an angel. He came as a human. And now the deed is done. And he came as a human and he died and paid the penalty. But we look at his person, and it's critical that you understand. This separates us from the Buddhists, from the, from the Muslims, from every other religion, every other cult. Because every cult, every other cult, every cult, because the reality of it is, is the cults do not believe Jesus was God. Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses, um, Christian scientists, uh, these are all groups that do not believe Jesus was God. Um, or, from eternity past. They might think, well, he'll elevate it to a God status and that you can do the same, but that's not that's a lie because the very nature, when you do a study on, on the theology of deity, is that God is eternal. So he has to be God from eternity past. We are not God from eternity past. Humans can never become God. It, uh, it is n important because Jesus himself says, unless you believe I am, you'll die in your sins. You will die if you do not believe that Jesus is God. And so when we go through all five of these topics, they're, in, they're, they're interrelated. None of these really stand alone in the sense that they don't have some tie into the other. And you need to understand man's sin and how the only person that can fix this is a God-man and how Jesus is that God-man. But then the third subject we went into is the death. And verse 3 talks about he died for our sins according to the scriptures. And in previous studies, we've gone and looked at the Old Testament passages that talked about this. I believe like Psalm 16 would be one, Isaiah 53, that would allude to a coming death of the Messiah. So I look at this and I understand he, that according to this passage, he died for our sins. This is explicit. Isaiah 53, considered the Old Testament best picture of the gospel. Jesus died for our sins. And as we read and looked at passages like Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27 last week, nothing ever needs to be added. And all four Gospels record his death. So his death was a substitutionary payment. And we talked about the idea of a substitutionary atonement. So once you get these first three elements down, the man's sin, the person of Christ, Christ's death, you come to the next element. The next subject matter, and it's verse 4, he was raised on the third day. The idea of resurrection is to come back from the dead. And Jesus Christ came back from the dead. We realize there are passages in the scriptures, like Hebrews chapter 2, that talk about how death and the devil could not hold Jesus. 
there's a legal righteous system going on that, to the best of my knowledge, as Jesus fulfilled all the requirements of paying the penalty and going through death himself, death could not hold him. Now, I believe that the penalty was paid to God the Father, but Satan, the devil, could not make an accusation to keep him in prison in death. So, therefore, as Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 communicates, he cannot be held. Jesus could not be held. What is important for us to know is what Romans 4.25 says. And this is a great passage that reminds us that, that Jesus Christ brought about our justification. When it says in Romans 4.25 that Jesus, the he, was delivered over because of our transgressions, meaning because we sinned, he took our substitute, but he was raised because of our justification. He was raised just as if we had never sinned, that we are in a perfect place. And we understand that the application of his death was made to us. And we went into the concept of the Passover lamb, how the Passover lamb could be killed, but if you don't apply it, it's not going to be effective for you. Well, when Jesus gets applied to our life through faith, which we'll come to the next subject matter, we realize that now, now we are justified. And the resurrection of Jesus and eventually our resurrection will indicate that we are sinless before God. And God, we say that he imputes us with righteousness. Now we know right now we're in our flesh, we're not perfect, but this idea of resurrection is something that is going to happen and it's going to indicate that God looks at us as people who have our sin paid for. Now look, the resurrection, I am sad to say, is often left out of gospel presentations. Someone will say, well, what's the gospel? And someone will say, wow, I think it's Jesus died for our sins. Well, Jesus died for our sins and then rose again so that we could rise again. The gospel has to include the resurrection. It's the ultimate hope. And I want you to continue to always remember that because how could you preach Christ if you don't preach a hope? Hope is the expectation of something good. And as I said, it's like a receipt. You go into a store and you get a receipt. And if somebody was going to see you walking out of a store with maybe a TV under your arm and they said, stop, you're stealing that TV. You pull out the receipt. And I know I paid for it. Here's the proof. Well, for us today, when you study a passage like 1 Corinthians 15, it's indicative of the fact that Jesus Christ, his resurrection, is the receipt, the validation that we are guaranteed a resurrection ourselves. So the resurrection of Jesus is, I, for us right now, the receipt. It's validation that because the tomb is empty, we will have one day an empty tomb. And as you continue to watch in the news, you can guarantee that maybe a couple times a year, you're going to hear uh, or, you know, something about how the body, of the tomb of Jesus Christ was found, or how the resurrection is invalid. I mean, the, the unbelievers, Satan has to constantly hit that because that's the hope. Because uh, if Jesus' body was ever found, it would destroy the, it would destroy Christianity. But it's never been found, and it never will be found because Jesus is out of the tomb and he is alive. All four Gospels record it. It's what we celebrate at Easter. I even use the word I hate. I'm not crazy about Easter, okay? Um, I like to call it Resurrection Sunday, but I recognize our culture calls it Easter. But the idea of the resurrection, the tomb is empty. And um, when we look at the idea of a resurrection, it, it gives us a lot of hope. Um, hope. And I, I, I know... That, that hope is precious, especially when you're dealing with death. Uh, the reason I say that is I've been to too many funerals. I've seen too many people go through the funeral process and bury a loved one and the pain of that separation. And maybe you've been in a funeral home where somebody is in so much pain that they've got to be carried in and out of the room or maybe want to have one last look at the deceased and they'll be have to be carried up to the casket and their tears are falling from their eyes and it's just it, it's heart-wrenching to be there and and the resurrection for believers leaves a different setting I find over and over at funerals is the fact that there's a confidence that that person in the casket will be seen again now we haven't seen resurrections <laughs> in our in our culture 
uh, it, there's a sometimes people will come out of a casket. I, I kind of like uh, smile. It happened again two weeks ago down in Ecuador. Maybe you heard about it. A woman they thought was dead um, got taken to a morgue, put into a casket while the family was processing her. Um, and she was in this morgue and she was in a casket. All of a sudden they could hear uh, after a couple hours of her being in that casket that she awakened. She really wasn't dead and she was pounding on the coffin. And, and, and the family rushed to the coffin and lo and behold, she was alive. Then they rushed her to the hospital and they ended up uh, being able to sustain her life for another week. And the article that I've seen, you know, about sadly women alive in coffin dies a week later. But that's been something that's, that happens everywhere, I find, across the globe, where sometimes people are put into a coffin, people think they're dead. I think the last time it happened in America, I did have an article that occurred in um, February in New York City. So, you know, you say, well, it's Ecuador, maybe they don't have the best medical practices. Well, yeah, we same thing in New York City, it happened. So, the idea uh, of going to a funeral and our loved one coming out of a casket is the dream that we'd all have because we care for these people that are so important to us. Well, for us who are believers, we have the reality that the resurrection is going to occur for everyone that's placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Hence, that is why, that is why we want to give the gospel to our loved ones and we want to, our children to believe it because we're so passionate about this. It's the only thing that, again, it's top priority. I want to say it's the only thing that matters. It's a key thing that matters, right? The idea that it's of first importance. So we've been through four elements. Man's sin, the person of Christ, Christ's death, Christ's resurrection. The reception of this is belief. In the end of verse 2, Paul talks about unless you believed in vain. And belief is at the heart of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever what, believes in him. Belief is a trust. It's a, it's a reliance. It's a commitment. We talk about belief. Like, I'm jumping out of a plane and I believe the parachute will hold me. So I hold on to the parachute. I strap the parachute, you know, on and I'm trusting in it. Well, when we look at faith, we must remember that it is a commitment. It is not just mere agreement. And it's not just a one-time act. It's a lifetime act. It's faith. But it's also faith alone. And that key word, alone, is critical. It divides us within Christianity. We know that the Reformation occurred and the Catholic Church response was anyone that believes by faith alone is anathema. Three times in the Council of Trent that was declared in 1520 to 1540 when the Council of Trent came about. The idea that it's faith alone. Why do we stress that? Not because we just want to make a doctrinal fight, but because Scripture teaches it. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, by grace we are saved. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not a result of works lest any man should boast. So there's the reality when you place your trust in Jesus, God knows when you do that. And the moment you do, you are someone that is saved. And I believe simultaneously you're born again, you become a new creature in Christ. But the moment you believe, it is not because you've done any, any work to earn or pay off the debt. It's because you've trusted you, from a human perspective, you have trusted in Jesus. You're not trusting in yourself. You're not trusting in your ability to be considered a good person. There is a renouncing, in essence, of who you are. You have to come to this realization that you can't add anything to this. If someone were to say to you, why are you going to heaven? You say, well, because I've done this good work or I've done that good work. No. I tell people all the time, and I'll use this illustration to the till the day I die. I mean, the idea is when I became a believer in Jesus Christ, the moment I became a believer, I was, uh, you know, and I had done nothing for God, um, but I initially believed if right then, that very half second after I became a believer, then I got killed, I'd go to heaven. Now, I wouldn't have great reward because I've only been a believer for half a second, but I'd go to heaven. But once I become a believer, and I've been a believer since about 1985, and I've done a lot of good works and good deeds, if I were to stand before God today, if I were to die today, and he'd say, Mike, why should I let you into heaven? It would be the same answer that I gave half a second after I became a believer. 
And that is that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the way of my sins, and I'm trusting in him. And, and, and there is no work that gets me into heaven. Works are rewarded, works are expected, Ephesians 2.10, but works do not get me into heaven. The book of Galatians says if anybody teaches a different gospel, they are to be anathema, they're to be cursed. And so we, we need to understand that faith is this commitment. It's a, it's a trust. And, and it's, a, it's a complete trust. And if I had to illustrate it, we just recently had a wedding at the church. And when you have a wedding, you have vows. Well, the vows are given not between God and man, between groom and bride, man to man, human to human. And a groom says, you know, I vow to be your, you know, your lawfully wedded husband or whatever, and, and uh, to love, to hold, to cherish, and all right? And basically you look to the bride and you say, well, are you gonna accept this? You're gonna trust in this? Well, no bride, would ever come back and say, well, you know, I'm going to give you a halfway commitment. I'll live with you on weekends for the first few years and we'll see if this works out. Um, I'm only going to, you know, be committed on Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays, but the rest of the week I'm dating around just to make sure that I'm right on this. Nobody would do that. That wouldn't be a commitment. That would be a trust in the vow that it was just given. So we need to understand that like we have in marriage that someone says, okay, I'll trust you. I'm committing you. I'm committing my life. That's the faith that we have. And we have to understand that ultimately, though, our faith is on the object. Our object that we're trusting in is Jesus. And if I could illustrate that, if I could illustrate that, when um, I look at the, the um, Exodus, let's say that you were a slave in, Israel, in Egypt, you're a Jewish slave, and all of a sudden Moses comes along and says, let's go, we're leaving Egypt. And you go with him, and you go out of Egypt, and you're going towards the Red Sea, and all of a sudden now you're trapped in front of the Red Sea. And you say to yourself, wow, this is horrible. I, I'm complaining, I don't like this, it looks like we're going to get killed. I should have stayed in Egypt. And Moses turns to you and says, well, go ahead. And you say, well, no, I'm going to, you know, I, I don't like you, I don't like this situation. But I am staying. Uh, this, is, this is where my focus is. I'm going to look to you. Get me out of this, Moses. It may not be the most perfect illustration, but the idea is, is that ultimately Moses is the one who leads them through the Red Sea. As he turns to God and God splits the Red Sea. My point being is the person that the slave had to trust was Moses. Eventually, obviously, with the focus on God. But my point is, for us who are believers, is our object of trust is Jesus. And sometimes along the way, we're not perfect. We're, God doesn't want us to be complainers. God doesn't want us to be disobedient. But ultimately, the one who gets us to home, gets us to heaven, is Jesus. And so you say, Mike, that sounds, sounds like, sometimes like you're splitting hairs. But the reality of it is, God knows who are truly his. And, and the people who are really the ones who are trusting in him have their focus on Jesus. And, and Jesus is the one who leads us to the promised land. So my hope is that you have this application, that you commit in faith like a groom or a bride commits. You know, that's how you're committing to Jesus. But your focus is on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So finally, what I want to say is, you want to get home to heaven? And, you know, people can sing about home on earth. They can sing Sweet Home Alabama. They can sing Take Me Home, Country Road, right? But we who are believers recognize that we should sing of heaven. We should sing that heaven is our home, and we would want others to join us. And there's only one way to get there. There's only one gospel, and that gospel is with these five subjects matters and like I said it last time you can maybe combine the works of Christ to be the death of Christ the resurrection of Christ under one category you'd say oh there's four but the reality of it is is you know what these five subject matters man's a sinner Christ's death Christ's person he's God in man Christ's death Christ's resurrection faith alone those are the key elements that I think you all need to know and as I emphasize again, you need to know at least two verses with this. And I'm asking you to memorize this. I'm asking you, 
and you can say, well, I don't, I, I, I don't have that memory for theology. Come on, you know how to get home. You know, you know how to go to your favorite places because you do it over and over and over. Come on, put some effort into this and then meditate upon it and then dwell upon it and secure, be, be secure in your salvation and be ready to give an account for your faith at a moment's notice to somebody. Like I said, you can do this in an elevator. You can do this in a very short conversation. You can do it at the checkout counter. You can do it to someone in school. You can do it in someone at work. Just go through this. Listen, you need to know there's only one way to get into heaven. As Acts 4.12 says, there's only one name been given among men, and that name is Jesus. Please know the gospel. Please believe in the gospel. It's simple as ABC, and I'll bring that lesson, that application back that we've used before. You know, as you have the rudimentary aspects of the gospel, ABCs, admit you're a sinner, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, that he's God and man who died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins, and C, call upon his name. Call upon his name in faith alone. If that's something that you've done and you need to um, go over that, contact our church. We'll be more than happy to either call you, meet with you if you're in the area. But for your a believer in Jesus Christ, I ask you, proclaim. Proclaim the gospel.